Hi, everyone. John Liebman here. I've got a fascinating interview coming up right now with Jerome Parker Wells. He's an American bass player, grew up in Germany, spent many years in Sweden, went to Tulane University in New Orleans, and does a lot of gigs and shows in New York City. He's into electronic music and jazz and all kinds of other stuff. That is Jerome Parker Wells' interview coming up right now. Hello, Jerome. How are you? I am fabulous. I am couldn't be better. You have such a fascinating background. I'm trying to get my head around <laughs> who you are and what you do, because the, the bio on your website says uh, atmospheric music sound sculptor in residence and experimental music artist Jerome Parker Wells is a free jazz bass player, ambient music noise artist, an improvisational avant-garde jazz musician currently working on a vegan-friendly, ambient, electronic, music-powered, multi-dimensional spaceship. What does all that mean? Who are you? In short, I'm a vegan who plays bass. <laughs> okay. That's cool. I mean, you're an American. You were yeah. raised in Germany. You spent yeah. a lot of time in Sweden. You uh -huh. lived in New York. You went to Tulane University in New Orleans. Uh, let, let's focus on the, the musical part of all that, the music that, that weaved through all of those parts of your background. Tell me about your initial exposure to music and how you became a bass player. Right. <clears throat> well, I had the fortune to be living in Germany uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, and I was, I was in an area of Germany that was very, well, all of Germany at that time was very um, rich with innovation and, and culture. Uh, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I, I started out in a city called Augsburg, and uh, there, this, this is about an hour from Munich. And between Augsburg and Munich, there was a lot of cross-pollinization. A lot of great musicians um, went back and forth between the two cities uh, and also the American high schools. Um, what attracted you to the base? Yeah, there's a, a funny story about that. I, I actually got a guitar when I was 14. And, um, you know, because everybody wanted to be Hendrix, you know. So uh, I had this guitar and I was going to be the next Hendrix. And long story made very short, the, my neighbor across the street convinced me to uh, play bass in his band because his bass player had had an accident and they had all these bookings like every weekend. And, you know, so they were out of commission and he, you know, conned me into playing bass and it, it worked. It took off really nicely. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I was doing that and the school band thing. And then um, I was in a band, a uh, couple of bands, actually, you know, German bands with people that uh, have later gone on to become, you know, names in that scene. See, that's the other thing. You know, Germany in the 70s, like I said, there was so much happening and it was only happening in Germany. So when I talk about like my, my most primary influences like Eberhard Weber and Lothar Maid, you know, nobody knows who these guys are here, you know? And then when they hear them, they're or like Peter, you know, Peter Trunk, when they, they hear these guys and they're like, that guy was playing like that in 1971. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, and these guys were, they were playing live, you know, is these that what made you uh, pick up the upright bass? No. What happened with the upright bass was that um, uh, there was a bass player by the name of Jimmy Woody, who uh, he was Sarah Vaughn's bass player. He lived in Munich. And he was, he became my mentor. He was effectively my father, you know, like I would hang out under him 
he was the one who encouraged me to, to take on the upright. And he really pushed me uh, that way. Like uh, there, was, there was a club in Munich called the Domicile where he often had uh, residencies with people like Mal Waldron and Johnny Griffin. And, uh, and one night, the beginning of the residency, he fell down the stairs um, and injured his hand. You know, this seems to be like a thread going through my career, bass players injuring their hand so that I have to step up. And like every night on the gig, I would be sitting on his side of the stage and just like watching everything that he did. And uh, this was a gig with Johnny Griffin and he, he just couldn't hang, you know, his hand was just like hurting too much. It was all bandaged up. He was doing the best he could. But he, it was his right hand, actually. He was doing the best he could, but he, he just couldn't hang. And he just looked over at me and he said, Jerome, take the bass. You know, so there I was on stage with Johnny Griffin. You, you would have been about how old at the time? 16. Wow. Yeah. yeah that's so you've I done a, a lot of interesting stuff, but as far as your music career goes, what would you say, how would you describe your primary focus? What is it that you do? Yeah. Um, for the last years, uh, the primary focus has been on, on the electronic music, um, because I play electric instruments, you know, I mean, I, you know, I have an acoustic upright, I do play it. Um, the majority of my instruments are, are electric and I've been experimenting a lot with processing them through different types of processes and you know and I, I have a background in like software engineering and coding so I've done a lot of uh, a, a lot of software synthesis um, so one of the big things that I started doing a good 10 years ago I guess was uh, building a modular system that I could process the base through live conveniently you know, without having to have like racks of gear or something like that, be able to, uh, being able to uh, create those textures and atmospheres uh, live using, you know, the Moog gear and whatever else I, I have and keep it interesting, you know, because there was, there was a quote by Miles Davis that really inspired me. Somebody asked him what the future of jazz was. And he said, the future is people will be improvising over textures, not chords. And I was like, yeah, I got it. Okay. And so that, you know, that's been the thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's been my primary focus. So in what context would you be, would you be playing electronic music or would you be playing straight ahead jazz or funk? You know, I've listened and I watched some of your, uh, your videos and uh, I, I got to tell you, a lot of people, when they hear names like uh, Anthony Braxton or oh, Cecil, yeah. Cecil Taylor, you know, that, yeah. and, and I have been one of them. We go like, yeah, you know, and I, I was watching something with Anthony Braxton yesterday. I said, you know what? I, I actually kind of dig that. It's yeah. not for everybody. But what, so where do you fit in that spectrum? Well, it's funny you should mention this because I know that you interviewed my friend Ruben Farias. Um, oh, and um, well, that was a Ruben, while back. Yeah. Yeah, Ruben and I have done some gigs together um, with uh, a really fantastic drummer by the name of Diodato Secure. And these guys are Brazilian jazz musicians. And you know what that means. It's just like notes everywhere, chords everywhere, just like, you know, the music can't be hard enough, you know. Um, and I have played with these guys doing my thing without having to compromise the integrity of what they were doing. Um, like most notably on six string bass. I'm sorry. I got to jump in. When you say my thing, what, what does that mean? Yeah. In this case, it was, you know, me on six string bass um, played with, uh, with the bottleneck slide old school yeah and um and a really really nice delay processor the uh volante the uh, strymon volante 
beautiful sounding uh, delay processor, like amazing. And, you know, I could just be there and, and you know, create the textures and, and complement to, you know, what Ruben does. Um, and that was like really nice. And then, you know, if I wanted to, I could play like a whole lot of notes, you know. Um, and yeah, that, that's like really cool. So, you know, when I talk about my thing, my, my thing is, uh, like I said, it's, it's very much informed by, by Eberhard Weber. I mean, this is, if anything, my, my primary um, influence as, a, as an electric upright player. Uh, he and Harvey Schwartz were the, the two guys that really got me excited about the electric upright. Tell me about your, your basses. What are you playing? Well, I, um, I've been playing Steinberger basses since Ned started. Um, I still have, I have my first Steinberger back here. Uh, it's a vintage, uh, early 80s L series. Um, I have a whole bunch of Ned's electric uprights. Um, so that would that would be the NS designs. Not yeah, NS. the NS designs. Steinberger, that's, that, that goes back, but his current uh, company is NS Design. And it looks like that's the, the upright I see over your shoulder there. Yeah, yeah, that's the NXTA. NXT. And... Um, I have a few others, like I said. It's just that I keep them in cases downstairs so that you know they're re they're ready to go. Uh, what do you like about uh, about NS Design and the uh, the wonderful instruments that that company makes? Well, I mean, I, I have a couple of the bass guitars as well. Um, they're just really well designed instruments and they sound really nice. They're very playable and they're very easy to maintain. Which is you know? mind blowing because Ned is nowhere close to any kind of musician. <laughs> He's a yeah, I know. I know his work with Spectre and then, yep. you know, his own basses. Yeah. Legendary. And again, not a player. Maybe that's what it takes. Yeah, who knows? But no, concentrating on things like balance and weight and you know those types of things. Uh huh. So and his his violins and Shelley. Yep. You know they're they're just revolutionary. They're just so fine. And again, the same thing with the basses. I mean, I got my first NS Designs electric upright probably in two thousand seven, maybe two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Maybe I got the first one and um, I've just been collecting them ever since. At one time I used to have one on each continent. So I wouldn't have to like fly with an instrument. And um, then I moved here to the U S three years ago and I just keep the one base in Stockholm and all the other ones are, are here now. Is that, uh, I can't tell, is that, is that a four string? Yeah, they're all four strings. Um, I'm planning to get a, a five string with a high C um, like Eberhard plays because that's another thing. A couple of years ago, I started a project called Yellow Fields, which is a, it's like a tribute project to, to Eberhard Weber. And it's, you know, it's a, a band just doing like Eberhard's music. And, you know, I can play the music on the NS designs, um, you know, much, much easier than you could on an acoustic upright. Still, uh, some of the voicings and fingerings that he uses, uh, they, they're much, much nicer and much easier with a, a high C string. So yeah, you, you said something that really got my attention because when, when you say five string, most people, a lot of people would assume that you're referring to a low B instead yeah. of I see. Yeah. Eberhard never played a low B. Um, because again, we have to remember, you know, that that's the other thing, it, you know, cultural orientations. Um, this whole five string bass tradition uh, that uh, we're talking about, it has its roots in guitar. 
Okay. So uh, hence the low B string, whereas Eberhardt is, you know, he's classically trained musician. His background is in cello and double bass. And, uh, you know, he wanted the extended range, you know, so that, you know, high C, why would he need a low B? You know, there's nothing down there. Uh, and, you know, he's playing with Reiner Brüninghaus. I mean, if he needed anything that low to happen, the piano has that. So. Yeah, a lot of people get worked up over things like that. Why do you, you know, why do you need a high C? That's what guitar players are for. You're a bass player. You're supposed to be playing down there and play the roots. You know? Well, I don't want to go down that whole rabbit hole with you, but I, I do want to ask you about, about mm -hmm. playing bass and learning bass. For BassPlayersOnly.com, we're primarily a, a bass instruction site, and we get a lot of people that kind of regret never having learned to play an instrument and they're at the point in their lives right now they're in their 50s 60s 70s i had somebody that signed up the other day 77 years old they're not trying wow. to be rock stars they just want to play some some uh some blues shuffles and some some uh classic rock riffs or some walking bass lines maybe a little funky r&b things like that get together with their friends and have a good time so that's the audience of the people who are learning bass with us. So in that context, what advice do you have for them, for somebody who wants to learn to play bass? What do you think is important for them to know? Oh, just keep it fun. You know, keep it fun. Um, like I was pretty obsessive when I was coming up. Um, I wouldn't suggest that that's going to work for, for anybody else. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, at that point in life, if you're reaching out to, uh, you know, to, to do something, find something to like enhance your life, bring a little more color to your life. Yeah, definitely. You know, keep it light, keep it fun. Um, you know, learn what you want to learn, play with whom you want to play with, you know, play what you want to play. Um, I, you know, I, I'm a journeyman. I mean, I, I made my living uh, as a bass player. My, my greatest asset was being able to fit into any musical situation. Um, and that required a skill set that included like reading and, um, you know, gear maintenance and, and things that, uh, you know, Nobody, you know, people that just want to go to the local blues jam session don't really need to be bothered with, you know. What about the future? What else is coming up for you, as far as you can see? <laughs> oh boy, there's so much. I, I'm just eager to, you know, to get back to work. Uh, very eager, you know. This, like I said, this pandemic is not going anywhere, and I, I'm just going to have to buckle up and get with the program, you know, and get back out there. And my continuing cooperation with, with Bob Musso and uh, Grant Calvin Weston, I don't know if you, if you know, Bob and I did this band Machine Gun back in the early 80s. And we've, you know, we've worked on and off with each other ever since on different things. You know, I'm just looking forward to getting out there and you know, playing roots behind people uh, as much as I can so that I can be, you know, because that's the way I've always done it. Like I would have like a day gig, you know, where I was like the, the bass player with some touring act that had like a hit record and um, that would pay for everything and that would make the money. And then I would use that freedom to go off and do the experimental thing. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's really the only way to do it. And it's fun. It works, you know. What would you be if you were not a bass player and something outside of music? I never really saw my life outside of music. The only times I've ever worked doing anything that was not directly music related was when I was working in, in software development. And that, believe it or not, that, that's like my hobby, you know, 
that was uh, something I've always found exciting and fun. And a, a couple of times in my life, I've, I've taken jobs doing that. So I'd probably be, you know, a software developer. I, I, I still don't think so because it's even when I'm doing these, you know, these software gigs, they're very quick and, uh, you know, they're done and I'm, I'm back to my normal life. You know, it's, yeah. Well, keep doing what you're doing. You know, having uh, coding skills, if you're trying to run a website, that's a skill that would come in very handy. And I knew it would for me. <laughs> and, yep, uh, yep. Uh, I used to look at coding, and go, <gasps> you know, but then, you know, everything makes sense, but everything is so particular and it's got to be just in the right place and boy, talk about going down rabbit holes. I'm not going down that one. Listen, this has been great, Jerome. I really enjoyed getting to know you and speaking with you in there. So we, we didn't even touch Sweden or all kinds of other really cool stuff that you've yeah. done. So we'll have to maybe arrange for a follow-up interview and uh, talk about your NS design stuff and your experimental music and your electronic stuff and your thoughts on music, all very fascinating. Keep doing what you're doing. Much luck and continued success to you always. And uh, really glad to know you, seriously. The same. Thank you very much. Uh, you take care.